Welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Seeler from SharonSeeler.com and understandingautoimmune.com. As always, it's my pleasure to be with you here on another brand new episode. To me, this is a really important episode that I wanted to share. It's tangential in some ways to what we normally talk about, but I think it's incredibly important. And also one of our favorite guests is back tonight. That's Sarah Payton. She'll be joining us. She is the co-author of a new book, and it's just launching next week. You can pre-order it this week. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic because we haven't discussed it, and I really think it needs to be brought to the forefront. So first, for those of you not familiar with Sarah, let me read her bio. She is a certified trainer in nonviolent communication and a neuroscience educator. And she integrates brain science and the use of resonant language to awaken and sustain self-compassion, particularly in face-to-face, like difficult conversations and difficult issues. And part of what we'll be talking about tonight is a difficult issue. And she also talks about self-condemnation, self-disgust, self-sabotage, these unconscious contracts we have with ourselves, all sorts of fascinating things like that we'll be discussing tonight, too. And she teaches and lectures internationally. She is the author of Your Resonant Self book series. And now she is the co-author, along with Roxy Manning, PhD, The Anti-Racist Heart, a Self-Compassion and Activism Handbook. And we wanted to have Roxy here, but this was last minute. Sarah and I were having lunch the other day, and I said, you got to come on the show tonight. So it's last minute, and Roxy's schedule did not permit it. So We're going to have both of them back in a month when we were able to get both of them so we can continue the conversation about the anti-racist heart. And the book that Roxy wrote is called How to Have Anti-Racist Conversations. And so that's where we're going to go. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks for being on the show. What a delight to be here with you. Thank you for (laughs) finding the time. I know it was so last minute. I really appreciate it because This is a topic we haven't talked about, and I have to be honest, when you brought up that you had co-authored this book, A, I was super excited, but B, it brought up a lot of thoughts in myself, like how am I showing up as an activist and an an advocate? Because one of the things that those who listen to the show know, I'm really a big proponent of being your own best advocate and a strong advocate for your own best health care. And then after our lunch, I went and I dug into the research and I found some Pew research. Let me bring it up. And folks, I'm going to read this just because I want to keep it accurate. It's from the uh, pewresearch.org. And this is about Black adults see a range of factors including environmental problems and less advanced care for their health care problems, is contributing to worse health outcomes for our Black citizens. And this, there's some numbers here I'm going to read exactly off the screen because it was shocking. 51% say a major reason for Black people generally having worse health outcomes is that they have pre-existing conditions. Now, why do they have pre-existing conditions? They talk about health and work environments playing a major role that oftentimes where the Black communities are in more polluted, more industrial locations, as well as they talk about the environmental issues and the stressors and the types of professions that expose them to so many other things that cause less positive health outcomes. And well, I could go on and on. It's fascinating. I'll put the link in uh, on our website, under, understandingautoimmune.com, so you can read the whole report. It really awakened me to the problem of not only being an advocate for ourselves, but being an advocate for others to have the same positive outcomes. And Sarah, I'm going to take it there, but I have a little bit more that I need to self-confess. But let's talk about this Pew Research. And how you got into help writing the book with with Roxy. Thank you. The the first thing is to just not only take like the the sort of wild facts of where do many Black people live, what kinds of jobs do many Black people have to take, and let's take a look at wealth in America. And so I was so surprised to learn 
that not only did redlining exist as a way that neighborhoods got together and said, we're not going to let black people in you know, neighborhood covenants and so on, but also that the Fannie Mae mortgage folks had it written in their regulations. No one was allowed loan money to black people. It wasn't permitted. It wasn't legal. It wasn't possible. My mind was blown because I knew about the redlining, but I didn't know that it had been law. I did not know. So that piece of information tells us a heck of a lot about now downstream multi-generational outcomes for folks because if your grandparents and great-grandparents weren't able to own property, what my grandparents were, my great-grandparents were, then there's no way for wealth to pass. There's no way for stability, property to pass from generation to generation. And so then you've got folks who have to live in areas that are polluted, environmental racism. And then you've got folks who are having to take jobs because there hasn't been enough well-being, economic well-being in the family to pay for generations of people to have professions that allow them, white-collar professions that allow them to be safe from job pollution and stress. So we see not just these bald outcomes that are shown in the Pew Research. It's almost like it's inviting us to look at this larger picture. So I started to look at this larger picture. And of course, as so many of you in this moment are probably experiencing, my jaw dropped. I was like, what the heck? Here I was. Basically, when I was a little girl, I grew up in a place up in Alaska. And I read about ghettos. And I was like, why don't they live somewhere else? They must like to stay with their families. They must stay with their fa families because they like staying with them. I had no clue. It was something you and I spoke about at lunch. Well, how do I know what I don't know? Absolutely. And the more after our lunch, I did research and I realized definitely for me, the fish didn't know it was in water syndrome. And of course, for everybody who's African-American, everybody who's indigenous, everybody who's Hispanic, everybody who's Asian, uh, South uh, in Asian, everybody who's listening who's not white is going, how could you guys not know? So I just want to acknowledge and bow to the experience of what Roxy has taught me to refer to as the global majority. <laughs> We've spent all these years calling people minorities when actually it's the white people who are minorities on this planet. <laughs> it's calling to me is a deeper understanding of what it means to be white. Uh, uh, this deep dive to prepare for our conversation after our lunch conversation was a, a wake-up bell. This conversation that I wanted to have with you today is, we'll first talk about the inner part, and the parts of the conversation aren't just about being white. It's about not knowing what we don't know. Yeah, and This can apply across cultures and all sorts of people in all places. It's just an awakening of, yes, this is the topic today, the anti-racist and, for me, the process of quality medical care for all. However, I want to talk about the first, our own internal, and this can apply across all swaths of people, about how do we come to terms when we have these moments of finally knowing what we didn't know we didn't know and getting out of this fish in the water? I love that phrase of the fish didn't know it was in water kind of thing. Now I know. So yeah. now what do I do with it? The very first thing, which is why the book, The Anti-Racist Heart, is both a self-compassion and an activism handbook, is because Self-compassion is what will get us through. And for folks who are going, I didn't know what I didn't know, then you start to step into this world and all of a sudden it's like bombs going off under your feet. You try to say something, you try to talk, people say, no, don't say it that way. And people, I'm just seeing people just crumple and curl in on themselves and stop moving towards understanding knowledge and integration because there's so much shame. Funny you bring up shame because in our lunch, when you mentioned the anti-racist and 
I apologize. The word was like, struck me interesting. I had all these multiple feelings. And my first thought is, but I'm not a racist. It was the discomfort with the term even. So that's why I wanted to bring this into a deeper conversation. At that point during our discussion, it wasn't going out there and saying something or intervening wrong or disenfranchising some. I think about the times when I've seen someone else take over and disenfranchise someone else's agency. Yes. But it was just even the term anti-racist. I was like, yeah, but I, I'm not a racist. I, so, so it was interesting, my own internal struggles, even with the term. Yes. And let's just acknowledge that for many of us growing up, the word racist was about people who, who were scary people who were violent, people who were calling uh, other people names, people who were dismissing or denigrating or firing or harassing people who were a different skin color. That's what the definition was. But now this word has, as people have made these discoveries and brought them into books and general conversation, like the stuff about the Fannie Mae mortgages, into the general conversation, People have started to use the word racist and anti-racist in a different way. They've started to use it to talk about the way that laws, pre- previous generations, laws and strictures and town agreements came together to create, and, and of course, enslavement, for goodness sake, came together to create after effects that still persist for the folks who are kids and grandkids and great-grandkids of the folks who originally experienced the harm, the the actual, like, legalized harm. And now we're like, well, they wouldn't have those laws now. But there's still after effects. There's still consequences. So the word racist is being used in such a different way now. It's really something that we have to get used to if we're born in a certain generation. Since we have limited time, I want to go tangential to this and get back to the conversation of self-compassion. On previous shows, we've talked about the shame spiral. Part of that, as you had mentioned, people try to intervene and realize they've done it in a clumsy way or an an effective way or taking away someone's agency type of way. And yet, you had mentioned people can go into shame and blame and guilt and all these things. Let's talk about the shame spiral and antidotes to it so we don't lose our activism and our desire to make change. For example, I had a friend who spent a lot of time doing civil rights activism who was at a recent dinner with folks who are African American or who are Black and who started talking about their experience of not having a lot of trust in white people. And my friend was dismayed. Now, the fact that they, these folks were talking about this very difficult issue in front of her actually is an act of trust, but it crushed her. The experience of being in a world where we don't get to, or not innocent until proven guilty in a way, can be really terrifying and dismaying. And if we don't have our self-compassion walking right with us hand in hand, as you and I have so often talked about in past conversations. For example, like here I am, I'm white. I've got these friends who are now talking about how, no, white people cannot be trusted. And I know some of why, but it hurts because, of course, it always hurts when people, uh, 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 that's the whole point of the experience is beginning to acknowledge the impact of racism on Black bodies and on Indigenous bodies and on Hispanic and Asian bodies. It's like we're acknowledging this impact. And now, as people begin to speak about what's going on much more openly, then we're much more prone to experiencing it ourselves and being able to both go, oh my goodness, and also to have our self-compassion walking hand in hand with us, not turning down the volume on it, just saying, oh, Sarah, sweetheart. Of course it hurts. And allowing you to stay present, not to center the white experience. The white experience has been the center of everything for so long and in so many ways continues to be. But to allow our self-compassion to let us be good listeners and good learners 
And people who are saying, yeah, of course, yeah, the system has impacts on personal people and on whether they can relax or trust. And coming back to the health stuff that you were talking about in the beginning, another piece of research shows a number, I think I have an article that has 48 or 148 different pieces of research that were done on what's called microaggressions and their health impact. Microaggression is everyday racism that's not noticed. You mentioned at lunch an experience a friend of yours had, that you were walking with your friend in New York City. This was just shocking to me, and it was one of those moments where I said, oh my gosh, this is a world I wasn't even aware of. We were at a store, and my friend is black. And as I went to leave with my purchase, they said, do you want a bag and a receipt? And I, I first said no. And my friend immediately said, oh, no, get a bag and a receipt and put the product in the bag and staple it, please. And I turned and just a little surprised, very surprised, and realized, well, what's going on? And they said to me, as a Black person, I never leave a store without the receipt and the product in the bag and I thought that was so far out of my world I had to stop and we had a lovely conversation of other kinds of I'm not sure how micro that aggression is that thought where I immediately have to protect myself purchasing a candy bar but it was eye-opening for me in that moment of where I had to really come to terms with the differences that, to me, had never entered my mind. Yes. And I love it that you said, I'm not sure how micro this is, because a lot of people say, there's nothing small about it. If you had mentioned that your friend walked down the street and you could hear, he could hear all the car doors locking. Yes, absolutely. That was when he pointed out that, oh, this isn't the only thing. It's not just putting it into a bag. It's imagine walking down the street and you hear people locking their car doors. Mm-hmm. And he said, sometimes rushing to their front door. Anna. And this is a person, an elderly gentleman, dressed, just really classy person. I Just a dear person. And I had known him a while and I was surprised that had never come up in our conversations and very saddened that we hadn't gone there. Yeah. And so this kind of thing impacts our beloved friends' health and our folks we don't know, our beloved people we don't know's health. Because what they've shown is that the more microaggressions a person receives, the more heart disease and COPD and high blood pressure that person has to deal with. So we get major health events coming out of these microaggressions, which are not that micro less visible because they're not micro. They really have an impact. And I think about the times where I've had microaggressions to me, that's, I'm putting air quotes as the term, where someone gives you the side eye or whatever it is. And I know this is no equation other than in how I can possibly begin to relate is being an older gray haired woman, how I've now become invisible. And I'm not equating that to the Black experience other than to say sometimes I have to relate, like, how did I feel when X, Y, Z happened? And then I can exponentially say, oh, my goodness, wow, that, that's not micro. And so this is the part where coming to terms internally, and I love the topic of walking with self, walking hand in hand with our self-compassion right there. To me, it's not about beating myself up for what I didn't know, but what action am I going to take now that I know? Oh, this is such a beautiful question. And this is a a wonderful quote that just came out from Ijia Galua, who wrote, being an anti-racist is not getting everything right. Being an anti-racist is holding that intention. It's like we're ships and we want a better world. And we're holding our rudder to try to get towards a, a better world. And the, the winds are trying to blow us off track. And the winds of historic pain are, are bringing us shame. 
But if we hang on to that rudder, then we can participate in really big systemic and important issues, for example, voting. Who are we voting for? So just like something really simple that we don't even think about, school board elections. A lot of people, their kids are grown up and they're like, my school board election doesn't count. I'm not going to turn in my ballot on this. This isn't important. The thing that's important is the presidency. No, but elections are alarmingly important. <laughs> like you, I hadn't thought much about school board elections. And it seems to be that in all areas of our world, we need to pay greater and more exquisite attention to. And what are the greater ramifications? What are the places where we hold a little bit of power? And are we exercising it? Are we exercising it for good or are we abdicating? Oh, no, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't have kids. No. We want our school board to be made up of people who are thoughtful, inclusive, who are also holding the rudder towards anti-racism, towards climate awareness, and towards systemic change in ways that benefit everybody, all the people on the planet and all the little plants and animals on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> like at lunch, we could just go everywhere. So I love about having spending time with dear Sarah. I want to reflect back on one part of our previous conversations, and that's unconscious contracts. And I think we've mentioned it a couple of times here in passing, but perhaps people aren't aware of what an unconscious contract is. I'm thinking of this as I think about my white experience, and my heritage is Northern European, so it's pretty white, although we do have a wide variety of family members from all over the world in our family now. I've never carried my identity as a name. I don't have Black American or Asian American, whatever. It's like an identity card that they're carrying. I'm just curious about all of these things. Sorry, I'm getting off track here, going to agendas. But let's talk about unconscious contracts, oh, and then we'll come back to this okay. idea of okay. identity. Let's, let's start here and then go to unconscious contracts, just because it's so interesting for me, too. The standard, this is how whiteness has been centered. If we say somebody's name and we don't say what their identity is, then we're going to assume they're white. Oh my gosh, fascinating. Yeah. Because it's been like the focal point of power. So it's interesting. What is it like to go, oh, I'm white? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> or, I, and oh yes, I, I love this person who's worked so hard to be who they are in this world and who holds the beautiful intentions that I hold for both anti-racism and for climate health. Amongst many others, different <laughs> crusades that I feel yeah. are so important right yeah. now. Yeah, the healing of trauma. Yeah. So then unconscious contracts, what role do they play? For those of you who've been with me and Sharon in this conversation for many years, we've loved this conversation, you'll know that our unconscious contracts are the ways that we hit a speed bump of pain and we have to figure out how to deal with it all alone. So we make a promise to ourselves to try to keep the pain from ever happening again. So we're corrected socially for a mistake, for example, and it's really embarrassing and humiliating. And instead of saying, gosh, that was really embarrassing and humiliating and having compassion for ourselves, we say, I will never speak in public again. Then we know that part. We know that we never speak in public. We know that we flush or turn red or start to stammer or lose our thoughts when we ask ourselves to speak in public. But we don't realize that it's in order to keep ourselves from being killed by embarrassment and humiliation and ridicule. And then we also don't realize that we're doing it no matter the cost to ourselves and the world. And what's the cost of not speaking up? The cost of not speaking up is that our voice is lost to the world, which is a tragedy. We need our voices to be in the world. Our voice is as simple as a vote and as complex as a public posting and as complex as deciding to run for office. There are so many ways where our voice is needed. And if we have these contracts to say, 
no, don't speak up. And we're prevented from speaking. We're also prevented from speaking, as we mentioned in the very beginning, when we're bystanders or witnesses to an act, to a microaggression, we don't speak up. We're not serving as advocates and voices for anti-racism on a day-by-day, minute-by-minute basis when we're out in the world. How am I doing on drawing You're doing great. I want to bookmark something, though, because I want to come back to it. I want to explain more about how we release unconscious contracts. Oh, yeah. But the part that came up for me just there, I want to put an asterisk by it and come back to it, is permission, consent, and making sure that we don't step on somebody else's agency. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. So let's work through the process. Everyone knows that Sarah and I run down rabbit holes. You should be with us at lunch. But I do want to asterisk that. But let's walk everyone through how we work with ourselves and honoring self-compassion and release ourselves from when we have those moments of realization. Oh my goodness, I just bumped into one more of my unconscious contracts. So we make these unconscious contracts when we're little. Like we're eight years old. We don't have a ton of resource when we're eight years old. We're at the mercy of our family. Our 13-year-old big brother is not going to stop humiliating us in public. It's a fairly good vow to make. I'm not going to say anything at all. And then we can stay safe. As we get older, we develop more resources. Embarrassment and humiliation are no longer going to kill us. It's an I feel it's fatal sometimes, but yes, oh. truly, it won't. <laughs> I, I know. I cried for two hours the other night after I had an experience of saying something and receiving a correction and I was just like devastated but I wasn't dead right (laughs) it was hard it was painful and of course when we're crying it's hard to have self-compassion because we're right in the experience of the pain but we might be able to say to ourselves embarrassment's no longer going to kill me I will survive it I won't like it but I'll survive it I don't need this contract anymore. And we say, Sarah, sweetheart, I release you from this contract to never speak, to never let your voice be heard in order to save you from humiliation and embarrassment. I revoke this vow. I give you my blessing to call on all the resources you have to help hold you in those moments when you're falling apart and to go forward faithfully with the intention for the well-being of the world and to hang on to that rudder. And when you get embarrassed, to lie down and cry for a little bit and get up again. Just, <laughs> I give you my blessing to know you're not going to die. And then you find that you have more voice. And it's quite lovely, extraordinary work. I, I have a beautiful story about a contract release happened recently via email. Someone who was in their 90s wrote to me, said, I've been learning about these contracts from your book and I was trying to work on it with my therapist. And it just was a lot of words and it just fell apart. And so I wrote back and I said, well, just what was the first part? What part do you know that you do? And the person said, my, the first part is I will make myself entirely and fully invisible. I will not let anybody know that I exist. Here we are, we discover when we're multiple decades into our lives that we've been carrying really old messages that we used to survive our childhood that are still in effect. So I offered her three or four different options, like I'll be invisible in order not to be killed by humiliation. I will be invisible in order to be safe from my siblings or my parents. I will be invisible in order to make sure the world is equal. And she wrote back and she said, the one that comes closest is to make sure the world is equal. I will be invisible in order to not take anything that could possibly belong to anybody else. So that I can be in integrity with my desire for a world that is equitable. Because the world is not equitable. And no matter the cost to myself, I said, okay, no matter the cost to yourself, but also please, no matter the cost to the world, no matter the cost to myself and the world, I will be invisible. Because we lose that person's voice. We've lost that person's voice for nine decades. I said, now that you see the contract, do you want to keep it? She said, no, it's silly. It's not serving me or the world. I said, okay, please say to yourself, I release you from this contract. I revoke this vow. 
And instead, I give myself the blessing to, and I invited her to write in the email. What was her blessing? She was like, to fully participate and to know that, that I'm not going to make the world more equitable by being invisible myself. People have such love for the world, for each other, for siblings, for their own survival that come out in these contracts. So I often just think of them as the way we tie ourselves in knots in order to survive and to love. That's a beautiful story. And it was so wonderful, but it doesn't matter what your age, you're not too old to do this, you know, and to release your, your being to be having a richness and a fullness, uh, no matter your age. And that's the, what I love about this. We need to take a quick commercial break. As I said, when Sarah and I get together, we go for hours. And I sometimes see people from the best of their heart tromping on other people's agencies. We're taking a really different turn tonight. Uh, you guys who've been with our community for a while, I hope you're enjoying that. We're expanding our venue. And it's not just about autoimmune, although interestingly enough, if you hold this, like the shame spiral and some of this other stuff within you, you will affect your health. And so about releasing trauma, helping others release trauma, seeing the world in a bigger frame outside of your own personal pain. I talk a lot about you are not alone. And I want to mention that's how our community is. We're here to support and walk with you on your health journey. But understand you are not alone has another meaning. And it's not how do we help others besides ourselves while still maintaining our own self-awareness and our own self-health. Sometimes I know in our community, we're such a community of givers, we can give and not be conscious of our own health. We've talked about that in the first half of the show. But now I want to talk about this idea of permission and consent and how we can support those who may or may not, but I guess it's a determination of may or may not be able to support themselves or even want our help. So let's just talk about consent and permission first, and then I'll get into all my other multitude of questions. When somebody does do a microaggression, when they notice, for example, that the ones that we, we had spoken about, the stapled bag, we talked about the doors being locked. Another nonverbal one that will happen is that uh, a white person will go into a, a party where they don't know anybody that has all different skin colors and only talk to white people and never reach out to the people of color because they feel shy and because they don't realize that it's a microaggression that impacts people's health to not be spoken to, to be ignored. And you told me a story about your trip on a train where you were a seat companion. And sure that, that was just... Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, here's an interesting one because this one was, I did speak out. I was in my 20s. I didn't have any of this information then. I'm sitting in a car of a train going between Washington, D.C. and New York City. And I was sitting next to the window and there was a, a black man sitting next to the aisle. And he, he was reading the New York Times. And as he finished each section of the New York Times, he would fold it and put it across the seat in the empty seat that was facing him in the little area of the train. And then a white man came over to our area and asked me, I'm two seats away. From the papers and the black man is holding a newspaper he asks me ma'am may i read your newspaper and i was just stunned i was actually shocked and couldn't speak i was like what and i all i could say was it's not mine it's his and the white man said ma'am could i borrow your newspaper he said it again like it was he couldn't even let in that his worldview prevented him from seeing what was actually happening, the truth of what was happening. And he couldn't, he couldn't flex. He couldn't realize, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Sir, are you done with any of your paper? I'm really bored. Wouldn't that have been lovely to just at least be able to go? And I'm really sorry about it. Obviously, I'm carrying some racist ideas about whether or not Black people get to read the New York Times. And, and a microaggression. This lovely gentleman who was reading the New York Times, something that would have impacted his health. And so 
what can we say in such situations? And here's that question of consent. It would have been very interesting for me to say, instead of speaking to the white man, for me to have said to my black Sikh companion, sir, I'm noticing that something very strange is happening, that someone is addressing me about your property. Would you like me to respond? Or would you like to respond? And that would have been a very beautiful movement because it would have acknowledged his existence. It would have acknowledged his sovereignty and his him having choice. And it would have made it really clear in a different way than me trying to manage this uh, unspoken coalition of whiteness. It would have broken it. So when we allow ourselves to come into that kind of consent, this question is so fun because I never thought of that possibility before, Sharon. I'm feeling a lot of joy at the thought of that, that being the conversation mm. of us expanding the conversations that we have, including people asking their consent, asking their permission, bringing a ton of respect to each person that we're interacting with brings me joy to even think of it. So I love it that you asked this question and brought that story out. <laughs> I've known the story, Sarah, and I've been friends for a long time. My question is, I'm wondering how your sea companion would have responded. I, I'm thinking that would be so such an, I love it. I think we should all work on consent. And when things like that happen, asking the person who the microaggression or the, that's really not that micro either. The aggression is happening to is just allowing this conversation to happen and being okay, even if the person you were asking consent of is surprised you ask consent. I've been out with other folks and I notice that I'll make a correction to something that somebody says. Someone was calling a black woman a girl. And I was like, woman. And the person I was with who was black said, girl is fine. Just said it like really quietly and just, and I know that the person I was with has a great tenderness for people who are aged. And the person who had said girl instead of woman was aged. And I, and it was like, I understood then, I mean, it brings tears to my eyes, but I hadn't asked consent. I had made an assumption and I'd been, because I'd been, again, here's shame. I was embarrassed that the, the older person used the word girl instead of woman. And so I wanted to stop that because it was embarrassing to me that they were making that mistake and not respecting the person that they were referring to. And and I and it was like such an interesting moment because I was like, gosh, I'm not asking consent. I'm making an assumption. And even from the place of goodness, it, it's in, wow, this is an interesting conversation because I know you and I know your heart was in the right place when the correction was made. And wow. So then we get to notice, we get to have this curiosity. Uh, now I would say, should I, should I say something? And my friend would come, no. And then it's her choice, right? It's not, I don't have to worry. If she says no, then I don't have to worry about it being a microaggression that's hurting her health. Because this is the other thing that we do as white people, which is so interesting. When we start to learn this stuff, we're like, and oh, correction, maybe? It's a, there's something they call being a white savior. Oh, okay. Wow. And there's, a, I'd better rectify all the problems in the world. And I'm the center of this story. And so what happens if we let ourselves not be the center of the story? If there's somebody to whom a harm might be happening, in terms of microaggressions, then what if they what if the person who's receiving the harm is the center of the story? What if they get to choose? It's a very beautiful and interesting question. And it can be extended beyond racism, of course, into those moments where we see folks doing, uh, people making comments about women, for example. Or disabled, or or disabled. how disabled, no. making assumptions that certain people need right. more help than they do, and you're taking away their, you're 
Yes, yeah. enabling them by your wanting to enable them. And really, this is one of the things that we're looking for for the rectification of trauma <laughs> is to enter relationship. Is to let people be real people. Wow, let people be real people. That somebody who's receiving a microaggression is not a victim, they're a person. I noticed that microaggression, it bothered me. Do you want me to say something? Sure, that uh, brings up a point in my mind, though, that well, I have to be careful for my friend. And when I say, would say something like, do you want me to say something? Now, might I, I don't know, I'm asking the question. Might I be bumping into their unconscious contract of just let it go? We might be, but unconscious contracts are important. Yeah. We break unconscious contracts. We also impact health. And then my poor friend just keeps going, let it go. I bring that up. Sure. Hey, you, you keep letting it go. And I, I'm, I'm a little, I feel the pain from the outside. I'm feeling the pain that may or may not be there. Am I assuming this pain or is there an unconscious contract or am I just totally off base? Sure. Most people don't know what an unconscious contract is. What if we have a really genuine curiosity? Because folks, especially in the area of race, have received violence, physical violence, mm -hmm. attacks, bullying, seeing their relatives hurt or killed. There is a lot that goes on in terms of violent responses that we don't necessarily even know about. So we're, we have that genuine curiosity. The other thing I'd like to name is that we can be offended ourselves. We can have pain about something ourselves. So then what if it's not in the presence of the person, not even maybe referencing the person, but saying to, so we've got A, B, and C, and is the black person who received a microaggression or the disabled person who received a microaggression. They say, we have that consent query. They say, no, let's not deal with it. I'm like, okay. But then I still have a glitch with person C. So I'm B as a bystander. Person C is the person who said the microaggression or did the microaggression. I have a glitch. I don't feel as good with person C. Mm -hmm. Separately from person A, I can have a conversation that says, person A, they weren't affected by this. This is me who was affected. When you spoke about this is how it impacted me. It hurt my heart. My tr sense of trust with you was fractured. And I just want you to know what's happening for me so that maybe something different could happen in the future. What is it like for you that I'm actually even talking to you about this? So the person C remains a real person to me, even in this conversation. And I'm holding my rudder steady moving through the waves towards the world of beloved community that I would like to live in. What happens? I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah, yeah. This isn't deep thought, folks. This is just thinking out loud. If person C, I mean, I could just think going so many ways. It really depends on the relationship to you. Are they familiar? As you said, most people don't know the term unconscious contract. Maybe they're not familiar with this kind of compassion conversation. Yeah. Maybe they're not familiar with that. And so, goodness sakes, what happens if they lash out as you disrespected me or from they start their own shame spiral due to the conversation between B and C. Oh my goodness, this can get quite complicated, Sarah. You really can. And two things that I love that Roxy says, and we'll be talking with her again later on, but I'll pre preview you, you. She says, people can change. Good Lord, people can change. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Maybe in the moment, though, they could hit a moment of a, a shame spiral speed bump. <laughs> but I, not. Yeah, <laughs> I always do. When I when people tell me that I've impacted them, I have a shame spiral speed bump that I have to get through. I'm usually much better on day two than I am on day one in terms of acknowledging impact. Um, <laughs> We're down to just about the last couple of minutes, Sarah. You, I could go on forever. But please, 
everyone, we're going to put a bookmark here because Roxy's going to join us next month and we're going to have an even greater conversation in the, send me emails in through understandingautoimmune.com or in the comment section if you're watching the video on YouTube. Send us comments and let us know. Look, the anti-racist heart, it explores so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Get the books. They're coming out next week. I'm really excited. You can pre-order them now on all the main places. Yes, they're on Amazon. And please support your local bookstores for this. Order it and have the, your local bookstores bring it in it, because it's such a, an important topic. And even though we just started on the topic of how it can impact people's health, it impacts the entire community's health. So it's totally important. Now, Sarah, tell us a little bit more about where to find the book. And then, oh, yeah. um, and if you just have a moment, talk about Fierce Conversations because oh, that's sure. an awesome new podcast. Okay, so antiracistconversations.com is the book website. And you can sign up for free book launch experiences with me and Roxy. There's a week of free book launch experiences with little classes and learning more about microaggressions and all kinds of stuff. And you get to look at your own unconscious contract. And? <laughs> Yeah, Fierce Conversations, a beautiful podcast that Roxy and I are doing where we have guests who are holding their rudder towards the intention of anti-racism in all different ways. Because sometimes we think that to be an activist, we have to be on the street marching, and that can be really scary But uh, because I'm scared of marches right now. But we get to be anti-racist activists in our writing, in our dancing, in our choice of music, the books we choose to read to our children, in the way we teach classes, and in the sculptures we do, in the paintings we do. Like it's, it's like this, is, this work can permeate us and we can discover our own voice. And this is podcast is in service of that inspiration. It's all about walking the walk, and sometimes that doesn't mean you have to be the one on this with the street sign down Main Street. You can walk your walk and hold your position. And oftentimes, people notice, like, okay, it's I don't want to say it's osmosis because you're walking your walk and talking your talk and being who you are, and that is contagious when people understand the passion behind it. And so, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us for this quick hour. I'm so looking forward to having Roxy and you back in September. Everyone, we got to cut it short here because we're out of time, but love you all. Have a great week. Whatever your adventures, join us next week for another brand new episode and bookmark September. That's when we'll have Roxy and Sarah back to talk about this in greater depth. So uh, drop us some notes about what more you'd like to talk about. What are your thoughts about the topic? It's a big topic to cover in such a short period of time. So thank you, Sarah, for being with us. And as I said, join us next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.